Hi, my name is Olivia Bailey, and today I'm going to be commenting on a project I've been working on with a couple colleagues of mine from the University of Iowa. I am an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the University of Iowa, and I did this project with Dr. Mark Graber, who is also in emergency medicine, and Dr. Abe Graber, who is in philosophy. Um, it is widely accepted that the traditional patient-provider relationship be governed by the ethical principles put, put forth by Beauchamp and Childress, those being beneficence, non-malfeasance, autonomy, and justice. Um, the change of medical practice has changed, and there's an increasing role for technology in this, um, which raises interesting ethical questions. Um, and one of the ethical questions we will be discussing today is, should some programmers be considered medical providers? And we will discuss the who and why of that. And then if so, should they likewise be subject to the, a subset of Beauchamp and Childress's ethical framework? So the ethical principles put forth um, are beneficence, which is doing good to others, non-malfeasance, which is do no harm, autonomy, um, the right of a patient to make his or her own decisions, and justice, treating patients equally and fairly. All right, so who? Um, Obviously, this would not provide to all programmers. Um, we're, we're saying let's limit this to those that have a medical decision-making capacity in their work. Um, so the individuals that are developing the algorithms on which medical decision-making is made, um, not programmers, again, except as the overlap with actual medical decision-making. And why? So, you know, in general, ethics, um, it, within medicine serves to protect patients from decision makers. Um, and you could imagine this could likewise be the case here. Um, there is potential for economic activity in these interactions. And it's actually consistent with the social security code, um, which states a provider is a person who furnishes bills or is paid for health care in a normal course of business. And this does not specify that you have to directly be billing the patient. Um, and you can imagine that someone developing an expert system um, is getting paid perhaps indirectly for their expertise. So I thought we'd start by doing a Star Trek clip to kind of just open your minds to this concept. Um, so for those Star Trek fans that are familiar with medical scanners, this will um, ring a bell. So this is the medical scanner. <laughs> and I apologize, I realize you can't hear that very well, but he's, you know, di the medical scanner is diagnosing congestion in both lungs, um, circulatory collapse, um, you know, coming up with diagnoses. So in, in this particular scenario, imagine if you remove the doctors. I mean, obviously the doctors are not doing much in this case. This device is, is what's coming up with the diagnoses. And for those Star Trek fans, Dr. McCoy is, you know, his medical expertise is frequently limited to the patient's dead or the patient is not dead, and sometimes he's wrong. So, you know, <laughs> in this case, we're clearly showing that the, the scanner is making the diagnosis and treatment, right? So we've got an autonomous device making the medical decision making. Well, right, this is Star Trek. I mean, this is not real life. How does that apply today, I think, is obviously what you all are thinking. Um, I think it's worthwhile to consider this now, because even if this isn't widespread today, I think we've seen the takeoff of medical technology, and it's easy to envision that this could be, certainly within the future. Um, and let, so good to think about it now. And there actually are current examples, so current algorithms that actually do make an impact on patients' um, lives. And we'll discuss a couple of those, um, those being pacemakers and computer-aided de detection for um, mammography for breast cancer. So there's been a couple of recent studies, um, one of which in the New England Journal of Medicine, the other in JAMA, about implantable cardioverter defibrillators, or ICDs. These are the devices that, um, if a patient's having a non-life-sustaining rhythm, can kind of shock them back into the rhythm. Um, the out of, and they're discovering kind of how they program it will make a difference for the patient. So the out-of-box, or if you get your standard ICD programming, um, is actually associated with unnecessary therapy, they're seeing, as they um, start playing around with the algorithms, and can actually increase mortality in patients. 
Um, so how these devices are programmed have a real discernible effect on um, patient outcomes. The um, other example I'm going to use is computer-aided detection for mammography. So radi there's been an increasing trend in radiology towards using this to help um, diagnose breast cancer, not just a radiologist, but actually a computer-aided detection system. Um, and we're not kind of sure, so we're using this, but we're not really sure how this is going to affect outcomes. So this is leading, in some cases, to overdiagnosis, and there is a higher rate of false positives with this. Um, and when you think about patients, this is not necessarily a benign thing. This leads to further testing, some of which is invasive, such as biopsy. Um, so it's worth considering, you know, this, whether this is impacting our patients. <clears throat> So a couple of other ways you could think about this. Well, how is this any different than any writer or publisher of a book or you know, up to date's a common um, uh, website used in medical practice? Is, isn't that just the same thing as a writer? Well, you know, writing is presenting the knowledge. It's not synthesizing it and putting it together. Um, it's a piece of information that a provider can use to care for their patients. Um, and again, these expert systems we would be referring to would be putting all the information together to come up with a diagnosis and plan. Um, another argument could be, well, is this like a curbside consult in medicine? So a curbside consult would be if you're just kind of running a patient by a colleague with another area of specialty to, you know, see what the next steps would be. Um, this would not be the provider actually meeting the patient, interviewing the patient, caring for the patient directly. Um, and in this type of instance, there'd be no economic activity. The curbside consult is just kind of talking to your, you know, your friend on the phone to see what we might do next. Um, and the consultant is not divided as, is not um, defined as a legal provider for the patient. I think you could still say, like, ethically, there's a, you know, a responsibility for the provider to do the best they can on the information they have. Um, and then the last would be, like, just discretion. So as a, as a medical provider, you could choose to ignore this information. You could choose to um, involve it in your decision making. It's just another piece of evidence to use. Um, and, you know, in general, yes, that's true. Um, it gets a little more difficult when it's built into the device itself. So, ex for example, for the pacemaker, it's, that's functioning independent of um, what the uh, healthcare provider would want. It's, it's acting on its own. Um, and it's also similar to traditional uh, provider-consultant relationships. So uh, the consultant still has a patient-provider uh, relationship that they are responsible for. And the mammography study that I mentioned earlier shows that physicians really don't ignore these expert systems. So if, if your um, computer-aided detection mammography suggests there's a suspicious lesion, providers don't ignore this. And, you know, I think we feel like if, if we see something abnormal, we want to act on it for our patient's behalf, but it might actually be, you know, potentially causing harm for patients. So what we're putting forth is that it's worth considering whether programmers, particularly those with medical decision-making roles, be subject to ethical principles such as a traditional provider-patient relationship. Um, I think we can all agree that beneficence would be great, so, you know, do right, do good for your patients. That, that seems very reasonable. Um, the non-malfeasance, do no harm. Uh, I think we all would agree that we would not want programmers doing that either. Um, not so much justice. I think, interestingly, this actually has a great way to be an advocate for justice. It would act the same and equally across all patients. It doesn't bring in kind of the bias that, you know, people may have. Um, the only difficulty with this would be that not all patients may have access to whatever technology it is, so there could be a disparity with justice there. And then autonomy. And this is a little more difficult because the patient, you know, especially if you've got an algorithm, has to understand that there's going to be decision-making happening that's not going to necessarily directly be happening in real time with the patient. But I think as we've seen kind of from some of the sessions yesterday, patients um, very much want to be involved in this. And as technology develops, they want to provide feedback and make sure that they're getting the best health care that they can. Um, so we would, you know, put forth that it would be worthwhile to consider having biomedical ethics training for programmers, especially those that are making expert sy systems that could potentially be making um, medical decisions. So I would welcome any questions you have or discussion um, on this topic.